Okay. So, we are in Parashat Ve'ele Amishpatim. So as you see, we have the Vav that connects to the word Ele. Ele means these, Mishpatim means laws, and then we have, and those are. So Rashi obviously come to ask the question, why do we need the letter Vav before the word Ele? Rather than saying Ele Amishpatim, so Chachamim already established, Chazal, that when we say Ele, it comes to refute the others that come before it. And if we say Be, and, that means it's in relation to the previous and it's an addition to it. Therefore, Rashi tells us that these bits of were given to us as a continuation from Mount Sinai. Like when we reached the adapt the Ten Commandments, these were also the laws that they received. There is another opinion that says that actually those laws they received before Matan Torah, before they received the Ten Commandments. And to tell you that despite the fact that they were received before the Ten Commandments, before Muhammad al Sinai, these also are part of that phenomenon of God speaking to Am Israel and Moshe in Mount Sinai. Okay, so now we understand that this parasha is going to have one of the parashiot that have so many mitzvot. We have few parashiot like this, but Mishpatim is definitely one of uh, a gathering of so, so many mitzvot. And the mitzvot are mainly on Nezikin. Maze Nezikin? Nezikin is a masechet in the Gemara that talks about all the things that can come to a fault, like then create a damage. That, that's, that's why this person has to either pay a penalty, or, or maybe even something more serious than a penalty. And then we have laws that have to do with Musar. Musar means how we should ethically behave. And then there are mitzvot that have to do with Mamon. Mamon means money, like you borrowed money, you have to give it back. And if you don't have, what should we do? And so forth and so forth which means that those mitzvot are basically come to teach us about how human beings should deal with one another and what is the proper conduct to do that. Now, we're gonna go to another word in this very beginning of the parasha and it says ve'ele, we already discussed, ha'mishpashim, asher tasim lifnehem that you're going to put in face value English means in front of them. But we have Chazal who explained to us, yes, the Chazal tell us, who are those who are going to talk in front of them, those kind of laws? So Chazal tell us, which means the judges are supposed to be knowledgeable on that subject. And then it says, but if it says in front of the judges, that means that it comes to exclude others that are not supposed to give it in front of them. And who are those? That's one opinion. A, in front of the goyim, because you can't teach it to the goyim those kind of laws. Why? Because the goyim, when they judge, they only look at the din, judgment, the measurement of judgment. They don't see nothing about the people around them. Oh, did this guy come and let's say, oh, he, he came from a very bad family, therefore uh, I, should recon I should reconsider what is gonna be the judgment. No, you stole, I don't care what was the reason of your theft, you are to be punished. If people of you have seen the, the play uh, Le Miserable or read the book of Victor mm -hmm. Hugo and he's the author, uh, 
he says there that the, the, the person who is the character of the, of the book stole bread because his family was very poor and he was put in jail for who knows how many years. I don't remember the amount of years, but it was many, many years. I mean, today, obviously in our modern society, this wouldn't happen. As a matter of fact, I believe that today the liberals have come to terms that, let's say in uh, Los Angeles, or I don't know where it was, that some, because of whatever happened there, that a person can come into the supermarket and, and uh, take stuff that costs, let's say, $1,000 and he doesn't have to pay. I mean, in other society, it would be called a theft. Mm -hmm. But suddenly the law became that this is the law. You can do that. It became permissible. Uh, the linguacy of, of, of child or, or young adult today is completely different than when it was in the past. In the past, mm -hmm. the green, yes? There was no mm -hmm. mercy. There was no division of uh, children, youth, and adult. Today, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess the Goim really learned through the century, through thousands of years, to become more merciful. But Chazal tell us that when the Torah was written, it was not written in front of the Goim because they totally see, judge, they, they judge and they see the delinquent or anything in completely different perspective, which is only what? Din, judgment. And lo lifne hediyoto, and we cannot teach those mishpatim in front of simpleton people, which means they cannot become the judges. How come? So Chazal say because they are only merciful. A simple mm. person has mercy in them. So they would say, for instance, they will rationalize. They would say, "Oh, he stole. You have to understand. Let it go. Forget about it." No, we can't, we can't allow justice system to be done only by mercy and definitely not only by what? Judgment. And that is in front of the Dayanim, in front of the judges, the, the, the Israeli judges should take into, into consideration that they have to do mishpat v'tzedek. They have to do what is judgment, but also that has to be just, which means we have to put judgment and mercy when we decide what's going to happen with a particular situation that come into the court. That is one commentary. Then we have Sfat Emet. Sfat Emet says, the lifnehem he takes the word lifnehem before them and he says, he says, those mishpatim that Hashem gave to Am Yisrael were given to them before, way before the will of a human being as a free choice came to place. Now, what is the differentiation? If a person and this is like a, a way of Sfat Emet through all his parashiyot, yes, where he, come, he give commentary on, on the Torah. He says like that. He says, a person is born, Hashem gave them free choice. In that free choice, a person has his own voice. So we all know in our own worried voice, we have a lot of defense mechanisms. One of the most common one is to rationalize, which mm -hmm. means if I did something that is not really proper, after a second, I'm going to rationalize and find it, it's okay. No big deal. So what? Nothing happened. Yeah, like let's say I uh, poorly held the, the, the glass and it belongs to my friend and I let go of it and now it broke to pieces. So my first, my first would be what? Oh my God, I was negligent. I was not careful. But I cannot take the, the blame on me. I don't want to say that I am negligent. So what am I going to say? Oh, big deal. It fell down. So let's clean up. Yeah, but yeah. that glass costs money. Or that whatever costs money. It could be small glass. It could be something big. Mm -hmm. Let's say it was something that really cost a lot of money. Yes. And the person, because of their negligence, just broke it. 
which means let's say it costs four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Oh, four hundred dollars is not like one dollar. The rational says, "Oh, big deal." It is a big deal. So our mechanism is like we try to minimize something that we are supposed to take responsibility and says, "No, that was wrong." I'm well aware that I was supposed to hold the, the glass correctly and I didn't do it. And therefore I should do something about it. I mean, from just, from just, you have to pay back. So Sfat Emet says, Lifnehem, that the Torah was giving to Am Israel all those laws to let them be aligned with their neshama. Because their neshama was coming from her, from God, right? From the celestial, from the higher celestial. Therefore, it really identifies deep down and knows truth and knows honesty and knows integrity. The question is, are you going to listen to your tzerara, which means all those defense mechanisms that I was telling you? One of them, for instance, can be projection, yes? I know I'm not good, but I cannot tolerate that I'm not good. So whenever I see someone is not good in the same level that I know I'm not good, what should I do? I will pinpoint it on them. Oh, someone is insecure, right? But he doesn't want to admit that he's insecure. So he identify insecurity in the other. And sometimes he may use it and manipulate the other person because of their own insecurity and so forth. But Sfat Emet tells us that we, as human beings, because God gave us this neshama, this very special, godly, call it in scientific connotation, particle, mm -hmm. but it's godly, and it knows truth, and it knows honesty, and it knows integrity. If I'm aligned with it, and if you resonate with it, then I know it is wrong. Who, let's take an individual, in the Torah, in the Tanakh, that actually wasn't using no, no uh, rationalization and actually admitted to the truth. There are two of them. We have Yehuda in Bereshit, and then his descendant, David HaMelech. Natana Navi comes to, to David and, and, and uh, uh, tell him, you know, there was this rich man who had a lot of sheep, and there was this poor man, well, only one sheep, and the rich man wants only that poor, the, the, the sheep of the poor. And then David the Melech says, oh, he deserved death. Like, really? He's not supposed to be deserving death. But David knew in his neshama, we're not talking about a sheep. We're talking about something more meaningful, more magnitude. And when Atar Navi tells him, it's you. It's you who took. Uh, Bacheva, the, the wife of, of, of Uriah. Not even for a slice of a second, David Melch uses rationalization or any other defense mechanism. What two words he says? I've sinned to God. That is to show you how careful David was in his uh, desire to always be close to God. And we can learn how he was close to God through his book of Tehillim, the book of Psalms, where we have Ms. Morim right and left to see how he was so in touch with how he wanted to be always in the place of integrity and honesty. So Sfat Emet tells us, don't ever think for a second the Torah is telling us that despite the fact that we as human beings who are not in touch with the Torah or Hashem may come up with some laws which today proves how much but it was right and I'm going to come to it in a minute that Hashem says these are the laws that I give you but it's already imprinted in you in your neshama I'm just coming to refresh it for you, to put it in front of you, but remember that it was there before, which means that when we submit our will to the will of God, 
yes, as we have in Pirkei Avot, עשה רצונך רצונו. Submit, yes, discipline, that you're not going to listen to your impulsive or desires or, yes, that is away from what God wants. Keep looking to get him more, you know, do better. Try to submit it to God. What does God want? Satemet says, what God wants, you already know. <laughs> but what, uh, what Hashem is doing to us is, is like almost like instead of us digging it from inside us, he's giving it to us on the outside. So Hashem Tassim Lifneihem. Now, you would think that what should be the first law that human beings should submit themselves to? If we would ask randomly, people would say, do not kill. That should be something that we should put on the front. No killing. Unless it's a bad deen that executes someone. And as you know, if you learn the laws of the Sanhedrin, like the Gemara of Sanhedrin, they, they investigate the witnesses who say, oh, we saw this person kills that person, yes? And they investigate and investigate in so many ways that it's very difficult to find a person who is really guilty, guilty, because there are so many details that are required to make sure that that witness is a true witness. To the point that the Gemara tells us in Masechet Sanhedrin, that a Sanhedrin, which means a group of judges who executed a death sentence was one to 70 years. And even that Sanhedrin, even that court would have been considered as Katlanit, which means it, it, it's too fast to kill. This is, this is like a very important lesson that we can learn that the Torah the Israelis are not so easy come to kill, which means do not kill should be really one of the most important mitzvot. And yet, if we look at our parasha, what do we say? We say, Ki tikne eved ivri, sher shanim yavod uvashvi'it yetze lachofshi inam. We're talking about slavery. And we're not talking just about any slave. We're talking about Hebrew slave. How did that Hebrew person became a slave? What happened? So, come in and tell us, for instance, a person who was working to his living, and then for some reason now, he lost all he had, and he has to make a living. Or let's say that he stole. And now they tell him, okay, you have to pay double and he doesn't. So now he has to be a servant to someone to pay whatever he owes. So there are servants, yes, they are, they are Hebrew servants and they have to be there maximum six years. And on the seventh year, they are going to be sent free. Now, we understand from this that if the Torah in Parashat Mishpatim started about slavery, even or servant, you want to call it whatever you want, that signifies what a person should strive for forever and ever. And that is freedom. Freedom of speech freedom to have the ability that your life as a human being belong to you and God forbid no one can violate it. The, the idea of freedom of space, uh, freedom to understand that I am the creator of God and therefore I deserve to be respected. And as a human being of God, I am to respect, not just others, obviously first myself. When someone respects themselves, they carry themselves differently. We call it today self-worth. 
We call it today self-esteem. We call it today confidence. It seems to be that the Torah is teaching us that the holiest of all holy uh, commands that we can give to ourselves and, and obviously give it to others is to make sure human beings are free. Now, that means that we have a tremendous responsibility as a society to create that freedom. To create that freedom means that we are to give to every human being from the minute they are not even born. Yes, when the mother conceives the baby, that there will be all possible rights and, and merits and, and, and privileges to that person to be able to carry that baby securely, healthily. So when he comes to the air of the world, he will already be ready to receive what he deserved to receive in this universe that God created. As I explained in my uh, Midrashim that I give all the time that oh, when a human being is born, Hashem tells that human being, you see this whole world? I created it for you. For you means the individual. Every human being, God created this world for them. As a society, that means that we have an immense responsibility towards the individuals, towards society, towards the community, towards parents. We have a tremendous responsibility and we cannot wash our hands and say, that's not my responsibility. Think about the most modern society of today that created a true judicial system and also gave a lot of some kind of social security, health, yes, insurance that uh, uh, would be for everyone and people who don't have this amount of money would have the, the ability to, to have insurance, health insurance, yes, as we have in America, right? Okay, now think about it. We call it, what do we call it? Medica, Medicare, fair? Medi, Medicare, Medicare, right? We call it Medicare. Okay, but a lot of people know that, ah, oh, but who are going to give the doctors to the Medicare? It's not going to be the best of the doctors. In order to get to the best of the doctors, you're going to have to have it private uh, uh, insurance. It's not supposed to be like that. If, if you bring a Medicare, it's supposed to be best doctors, for everyone, those who have the those who don't, don't need Medicare for sure, go spend the money and, and get the best doctors, but also who are in the bottom should get the same treatment. And where is it coming from? From the idea that God said, I created this world for you. And I'm talking about the individual. So we are all equal in the eyes of God. So when, when we have these uh, 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 um, laws about the Hebrew servant, which is definitely is a very specific set of laws that was given to Israel, which is different than what we would give to the Goim, because I just told you that the Goim, to begin with, they judge people only with the attribute of what? Or judgment. Is it different today? In a way, yes. In a way, yes, society has been definitely improved, uh, reformed, uh, really uh, have transformed themselves into being more on the mercy side than only judgment. Yet today we see a very interesting phenomena that they go into the extreme into the extreme, which the extreme, as I explained many times, is exactly like what? The other opposition, which means they, they want to exempt any kind of judgment mm -hmm. and keep your whole as if there is only mercy, but really that's not true because that's called chaos. Mm -hmm. And chaos will bring what? Judgment. Because the two extremes sit on the same place, but we just look mm -hmm. different. But that's not what God wants. God wants that we as human beings is we will create a judicial system. And the system has to be known that sometimes there are people 
who put themselves in a situation that there is no other choice, that now they have to serve others, which has to do with judgment and mercy as well. And we are going to see the mercy later on in, when I get into different passage on the parasha that suddenly it's all about mercy. But let's hold on for a second. So here we see that, that this Hebrew servant can work only for six years. And on the seventh years, he is to be free by his master who took him for those six years. Now that he took him for six years, he cannot just tell him, okay, you're free to go. There are such specific laws that I feel like when that person owes and the master now is under him, that must have become actually the servant of this servant. <laughs> because we have specific laws. You'll be surprised. They say he has to give him food before he gives himself. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, a lot of specific laws that actually show that the master is to shower him with kindness. Yes, he will work, but the master works as well. So there's no difference about the fact that he works and that one works. But the master has to take care of that servant. Now, what is it the need to give them, to shower them with love? Because we need to do a corrective behavior. Must be something has happened for this individual to reach that stage. And obviously the Torah tell us, you know, you are to show mercy as I explained, but you have also to touch the end of what? Of judgment. We cannot leave this alone and that alone. We need to put them always together. Now it says to us that if he was single when he came and he left single, then he goes as he is. But if, yes, in if he was married, now he was married, the master has to take care, not only about that servant, he has to take care of his wife. And when they leave, they live together as a husband and wife. Now it says here, look very, very interesting what it says. It says, and if his master is the one who gave him a wife, yes, if he gave him the wife, then what happened? And she gave birth to children, boys or girls. Ha'isha adonia very interesting phenomena because the master gave him a, a, a wife whatever outcome come from that relationship the children and the wife that was his during those six years now don't belong to that person they belong to the master very interesting that we are looking at it from in this point of view it's a little bit of a judgment here right because mm -hmm. you think that Okay, you gave him back, he's married to her. What would be what would be the 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 ramification of something like that if the if the servant knows that he's gonna have to leave his wife and the children to this master? What would be his thought really? I don't want to get married if I don't take my wife with me and my children with me, I'd rather stay single. That one ramification. Another ramification would be that he would say, Wow. I don't want to lose my child. I don't want to lose my wife. Let me stay a servant. And that's what took me. If the servant is going to say, I love my master. I love my wife. I love my children. I'd rather stay what? Servant. Then it says that the judge, yes, it says Elohim here. It means a judge. will bring him into the door and will do something with his ear. And Chazal were asking all the time, what's that ear? What does that have to do with the ear? But Chazal says, the ear who says, Lo al panai, which means that the human being is supposed to strive again for freedom. The free to will, the free to think, the free to make decisions and not to be uh, moved by, by some power that enslaves you and condition you that you have no room to think. And therefore that ear who heard in Mount Sinai and now 
refuses to pay attention to it is the one who is going to be actually uh, hurt. Now, we have many mitzvot during this parasha, but I want to go into a very interesting paragraph in the parasha that tells us suddenly something very interesting. It says like that, in Perek, uh, yeah, in Perek of Gimel, which is chapter 23, in Pasuk Kas, Pasuk 20, it says like that, Hine Anochi, here I am, Sholeach Malach Lefanecha. I'm sending in front of you, Malach could be a messenger. Yes, like an angel, but it's a messenger. Lishmorcha Baderech, he's going to watch you over the path. And to bring you, to the place that I have prepared for you. And then it says, watch up from him. And listen to its voice. Don't uh, refute it, don't change it. He's not going to pay attention to your crimes. He's because my name is inside it. Because if you're going to listen to its voice, and, and you're going to listen to all what it's going to speak. And I all your enemies are going to be under your hand. Because my angel is going to go in front of you. And so forth. Don't bow to them and don't do this and don't do that. Now, Fatemet is teaching us something very interesting about this pasuk because he says it's a very, uh, a very uh, different passage that has a lot of mystery in it. And then he says like that. Sha'arakatuv Romez, the the written is coming to hint to us something. Hine anochi sholeach malach. Here I am sending an angel or a messenger. Umer, hamalach hu kaamu haasiya apshuta. Hamaasim sheena mitzvot vachafatim sheena mireim kechafzei mitzvah. He says you have to pay attention and be careful when you are going to come to the land. There's going to be a lot of activities, a lot of small things that we are going to do in our life that they may seem as if it's a choice I make. It's my own labor. It's my own decision. And as if it's detached from the commandments of God. Yeah, like, okay, I want to go here, I want to go there. Uh, I'm going to visit this, I'm going to visit that, I'm going to go to this restaurant, I'm going to go uh, take a walk, I'm going to be befriended with this one, with that one. Seems to be like as if it's like because it's the mundane of life, it has nothing to do with mitzvah or avera. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with this or that. And the Torah says, Hishamer mi panav. Watch out from, from this uh, 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 convincing manipulation. He's saying, Because it's going to be a lot of He says, don't think that in your daily activities, mundane, small stuff, little details, you may think it separates from the Torah and the mitzvot. He says, no. Watch out. This is the power of whom? Of Yetzirah. To manipulate you and let you know Oh, these are things that you should choose. You're free to choose. No. Even of those little things, small, small things, yes, as we say, God is in the details, yes? Even on those details, we need to know that God speaks to us as well. Yes? Umerpo al-tamer bo. Maze al-tamer, which means 
don't change don't change the story don't yeah. tell me oh this has nothing to do with the story find me it has to do with the taste it has to do with uh whatever yeah let's say the someone likes uh, rap music and every other word of the rap music is a curse <laughs> because that don't know it exists right so you you may think but i like rap music so what if it's a curse he says, Alta Merbo, don't be mistaken to think that, oh, this is, this is secular, you know, God doesn't care. No. God is in everything that we have in this universe that was developed. And therefore, you need to ask yourself, is it godly? Is it something that I need to align myself is it a music that will resonate with God? Or it's a music that I call some sitra achara, yeah? Because it has a volume of anger and cursing, then, then it's not going to awaken me into the channel that I want to be, the channel of what? Be aligned with God. Yeah. Because it says, kishmi bekirbo, means that Anything that is in this universe, it's the creator of God. It's the creation of God. And therefore, it speaks of God. Now, Sfat uh, Emet continues with that, and he makes a parallel between the mitzvah of sheshet yamin ta'avod ve'asita kol melachtecha six days you have the ability to work and complete all your tasks yes and then it says v'yom shabbat shabbat l'Hashem and in shabbat it's a shabbat that belongs to whom l'Hashem the spot stayed very bad strawberries. Uh -huh. uh, Frida, you have to uh, put silent on your. Uh... Oh, I didn't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So Shabbat Kodesh is Me'en Olam Aba. But Shabbat has many, many, many blessings that tie to our six days of our Melech. As a matter of fact, Chachamim tell us that when there is a mitzvah that is kula keneged kol mitzvot, which means there are certain mitzvot that the Torah tells us that as are equal to tariyak mitzvot, to all 613 mitzvot. Yeah, like you complete that, it's like you completed all the 613 mitzvot. There is a concept like that in the Gemara. And which one of the mitzvot is Shabbat? When some, someone keeps Shabbat, kehil chata, which means as it is supposed to be, that you know all the laws, exactly what's allowed, what's not, and you're capable with all of that, then, then that is equal to as if you completed all tariyat mitzvot in one shot that day. And Sfat Emet explained to us, that what it means is that this particular mitzvah, which we call Shabbat, mesugelet litikun klali shelaguf kulo, which means it's like a healer of the whole body, which means on Shabbat, if we keep it the proper way, we have the capacity that all our body is being healed. It is metakenet, it is uh, going through some kind of a correction in all Ramach Ha'evarim v'shasadidim, in all our 2248 organs and 600 and 365 our limbs. But there is one more thing. 
What is so special about the Shabbat that in every parasha that we have always is mentioned Shabbat? Yes, also in this parasha. It says, Fatimid says, Sheshmirat a Shabbat Guremet la Adam lekayemet a mitzvot kula. Means when someone keeps the Shabbat from A to, to Z, it helps them fulfill all the mitzvot, which means like all the rest of mitzvot become a piece of cake. <laughs> it becomes available to us. It is uh, resonates with us. We are welcoming those mitzvah. We are doing them with joy. Yes, because we all know uh, that the main mitzvah that Hashem asks us how to serve him is besimcha with a lot of good hardship. Yes, even if it's a hard labor, you do it with joy. And, and the simcha, the gladness is to be with all your heart. Yes, both of them. The vav, it's two. Now we understand that Sfat Emet is telling us that why is it that always the six days we say, and then we say Shabbat. And now we explain that Shabbat actually is the Mekora Bracha, the source of all blessing, that whatever you have in your six days is actually a, a, a result, a ramification of whatever happened on Shabbat, you will be reflected on your six days. And Svat Emet tells us that what can come from the six days is a little bit where the master of Yetzirah is, is a very powerful there. Why is it powerful? Because it says, Adam can say, Kohi yadi asali which means I work hard, I invested. Some of us really work hard, whether it's in our brain or whether it's physically. Yes, builders, contractors. Suddenly they see a building of 30 floors that they were in charge, that they did the architecture, that they had all the workers building it. And now this is, this is what I made, yes? So a person becomes his ego, becomes so big, he takes credit over that. So Chachamim tell us that in the six days, we have prayer that has to do with what? With asking for our needs. But on Shabbat, we don't have it at all. How come? So Chazal Masbirim, they explain that the reason that we have in the prayer, the request, is that we are not going to fall into a kuchi ve'otzan yadi, that I am, I am the master, I've done it, I take all the credit, it's all because of me. Chazal come to teach us that not everything that happened to you on your daily, the days of the week, is a blessing of Shabbat, that's one. B, is that God has given you the ability to get there. Now, what is it that God allows someone to have more or less? This is God's accounting. That has nothing to do with us because there are some people who invest, 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 and they lose all their money. So it's not about, oh, I invested. No, it's about how God puts a blessing in whatever you do. It doesn't matter if a person earned less or more, as long as he understands that this is the will of God. In Ken, a Torah Dosha, our holy Torah, Mazira, she's warning us in those smichut psukim, which means the had the psukim come together. What does it say? Ve'achalta, ve'savata, yes, as we say in, in Kriyat Shema, that we ate and we were satisfied. We just did eat, we really were satisfied. Yishamru lachem penifte levavchem. Don't allow your heart to say, oh, I've done it. It's my privilege. It's, it's because I did it, now I enjoy the labor of my, fruits of my labor. No, no. The fact that you're working is only this amount of portion that you may say, okay, I've done effort. Really, it's all straight from God. And we learn that from Shabbat. I'm sorry, I had just to tell my, my son something. 
Yes. Okay. In Kane, Spat and Nate wants to teach us that we as human beings need to internalize and listen to that voice that Hashem says is inside us, the Malach, as he said. That voice that is inside us knows that it's all from God. Those who have the merit to remove their ego and to be in a place of the eyeing of this nothingness, they are the ones who God showers with all possible blessings, including including those who want to excel in the learning of Torah. When a person acknowledges that all their knowledge and all their understanding comes straight from God, and they honestly remove their ego and become so humbled in front of God, they are the ones who are actually being zoche to listen to that inner voice, the godly voice, that will lead them to all possible levels of honesty and integrity and understanding what God wants from them. Fatimeth adds and says something very interesting. He says that the Pasuk says, Translation. When you serve God, Again, how do we serve God? We just explain. Yeah, you remove your ego. You understand that you are nothing. You're in a place of nothingness. You really get to that place and you understand it's all whatever I have. It's all a gift of God to me. It's a gift. Every iota of our knowledge, brain, capacity, whatever it is, potential, anything is all all, no exception, from God. When a person gets to that place, what does he receive? He receives a blessing that his bread is going to be a healthy bread. He eats it and it's going to turn into health in his body. Water, the same thing. And then, I will remove any possible sickness from within you. Our stomach or our body. The Zohar Kadosh, the Zohar, tell us that we have learned from many places that our body gets hurt mostly because of the food that we consume. What does it mean? Perusham shel varim al pip nimiyut ki otora ayon dilel. He says, oh, we have to go through the same idea that I just spoke, Fatima. When a person eats whatever he thinks it's his own labor, when he thinks that kuchi v'otem yadi asali t'chay l'ze, that I am the master and I've done all for myself, because of myself, that approach, yes, that he feels that, oh, it's I work so hard, now I'm, it pays off because now I can buy, I can consume and all that. He says, oh, all sicknesses come from there. From where? From the approach. It starts from the approach. But, Whoever eats, which means he eats his food, understanding that what? That God is the one who actually stopped all activity. If God stopped all activity in Shabbat, I don't ask for any needs, I just praise God. That means that if I take that attitude into my six days of work, of labor, then, then, of course, you're going to be healthy. Health will come to you. 
And that's the meaning that I Okay. One more idea I want to bring into this uh, before we uh, complete the class for today. This is another subject. In, in Perek, yeah, in Perek Kabe, Perek 22, in Pasuk, uh, of Aleph 21, it says, Kol almana veyatom lo te'anu. We have now a very specific mitzvah that says, any widow and any orphan don't cause no suffering to them. Because if you are going to cause them any level of suffering, especially if it's a repetitive. He in tzaok, he tzaak elai, shamoa eshma tzaakato. If that orphan or that widow is going to cry, no matter what's the reason, what the makeup of what they reach that place, I'm going to listen to that prayer, to that cry. And then I'm going to show the wrath, the character of wrath in me. And therefore, you will be slaughtered by the sword. And your children are going to be widows and orphans. Very interesting that in this uh, specific mitzvah, we see a deviation. Before we say that in the attribute of justice, that in front of the judges, we bring mishpat v'tzedek. We drink the judgment, and then we try to do just, which means we bring the element of mercy. But God says over here that he's a specific attitude towards the needy. Before he says the girl, the convert, yes, we are also to treat them as equal, never to look down on them, God forbid, never to put them in a place where, oh, but you are an, you are, you are the convert. No. Don't you remember you were converts in Egypt? God is teaching us that we are to be so careful how we treat people who are vulnerable, who are sensitive. And interestingly enough, in that specific mitzvah, we understand that yesh ma shnikra yitzi'ah min ashu'ah. What does it mean yitzi'ah min ashu'ah? Means that God tends to tilt into a different direction. Not so much in the middle, but there is a tilting. Tilting towards what? Tilting towards understanding who is God. You know, Rambam, Maimonides, teach us that we cannot describe God in a positive connotation. We only have to say what he is not. And when we understand that what he is not, from there I can try to understand what he is. That's in the format of God. Besides few descriptions, the one that we are to put in front of us is the concept of love. Ahava. That God is a loving kindness. That description we are allowed to say on the positive tense. And the Torah proved to us in many places that God says, I am rachum v'chanun. I'm merciful, and not only merciful, I'm also chanun. And what's the difference? Rachum means I give the person the benefit of the doubt. Oh, I try to see points 
where we can look at them as merit. For instance, uh, a child behaves in a, in a rough way. We check the home, we see that the parents are very rough to this child. Yes, they, their parents, let's say, hit the child every second, abuse the child every second. And the child comes into the school and then what does he do? He does it to others. So if you're angry at the child, then you're not using the approach God wants us to use, which is what? Loving. That child screams for love. That child screams for attention. And therefore God teaches us, I'm rachum, which means I look at the situation and I give the person the benefit of the doubt. Or I put a lot of schuyot on him. I say, no, I'm not surprised he's like that. This and this and this is happening in his life. It's when there is judgment, supposed to be judgment, but the person is in pain. He's so much in pain that God only focuses on what? On the pain. And because he focuses on the pain, he spares the person from the judgment. Because when a person is in pain, they are most vulnerable. They are actually reaching closest to the point of what? Of the ayin. And as I said, when there is the ayin, God appears. So we have to be very careful how we treat people and to what situations society brings, not just one individual, but a whole group of people. And if a whole group of people is being tormented and tortured and abused and misused, is I'm so sorry to tell you, I am so, so sorry to tell you that today the people who are on the top are the most abusers. It is terrifying because that means that as a society, we're gonna take huge responsibility of all the people that they're abusing because of their power. So don't be surprised if something is happening in our society in certain places in the world, because God, black and white tells that is what is going to happen. If we don't treat the widow or the divorcee, because to me, a divorced woman or a divorced guy, the same thing, yes, depends who is the one who, who is in that and uh, uh, is, the, is the victim of, of an abuse, yes? Uh, or those orphans, and I'm not just saying orphans as orphans. We know very well today when you uh, study children who come up from divorced family, how much they suffer because of the horrendous abuse that they have experienced in that unit. God says, if they cry, if they cry to me, if there's an abuse, just remember I'm here and I'm not gonna let it go. So society again has to take a huge responsibility over how we go about raising a society that should be a healthy society. I just happened to listen to a lecture of some scientist, yes, who is a very clever, his name is Jeremy or something, I don't know the last name. He says, he says that uh, society today, even though still is in the dark ages in some aspect, <laughs> really they should be ready, and I'm not joking, he has a right there. We should be ready already to understand that as a tribe, yes, and if, Every community is like a tribe. Every country is like a tribe. Our most concern is to only shower each other with love, kindness, mercy, and, and, and make sure we help one another. Make sure that we create laws that allow to people who have suffered to get out of their suffering. We must change our perspective and attitude towards who is most important. 
people. Not, I need to have more buildings. I need to go to space. I need to go there. No, we are to focus on making all our means. Helping communities, centers, health, parenting, therapy. And it should be for free, means the government should pay for it as a health insurance. But a health insurance that captivate all areas of human development. And I'm telling you today, we have places that already have what we call the gun Eden. But they understand that approach. There are some communities, some places that it's, 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 they understand that that is the most important. Because when we allow a child to grow healthy and we allow parents to have the support system they need in order to raise a healthy child, we are giving them the knowledge, the, the support, the money, the means to be able and not to make them slaves to their work so they forget about the other children put their children in some place that they don't know what's going on with them. Or, or, or a, a one woman taking care of, of 12 children, how is she gonna do it if they are infants or babies? Do you think she's gonna be the ideal caretaker? These are the things we need to focus. God says, I am the God of the details and I need you to emulate that as well. Pay attention to the details. And I'm telling you, there's going to be a deviation, God says, where, where the orphan or the person who, who, who has debts and, and went to the bank and now the bank is harassing them because the rebate is 10 times more than what he is expected, then that is an abuse. And I'm going to listen to the cry of that person. I mean, these are God's words. We have to understand our Torah was given from Shemaim to Moshe because he had the merit to bring it down and to allow us to understand what's not good for us should stay away because it's not healthy for the human being, sanity, psychology. That we cannot put people in a situation where they cannot continue to grow, to be the free person that has a choice to live with freedom, freedom of thought, freedom, the ability to sit in school and learn in peace, that we can encourage them that knowledge is power, that we can teach them the boundaries, that we can give them vessels, kelim, so they know how to conduct themselves when they are mature adults when they form their identity and their identity has internalized Musa, ethics, values, that a good heart, that we don't talk Lashon Ara, that we don't think evil about people, that we don't look to put someone down, that we are helping each other to create a healthy community and a healthy unit. Look what it says here. We have situation where people are giving their own clothes because they need to borrow money. So they put their own clothes on, on as, as a, a collateral. And Chachamim tell us if that's his only clothes, when the sun set, go give it to him. Even though this is your collateral. And what does Hashem say? And if he is going to lay down, which means in his sleep at night, and he's in such a grief and sorrow because of his helplessness, it's ak a lie. If he cries to me, it means he has to turn to God, right? Veshamati, I'm going to hear it. Ki chanun ani. Despite the fact that maybe in judgment, this person has to go through this experience for some reason. Yeah? But because he's crying to me, suddenly the judgment is being erased and all God sees is the cry. 
this parasha is teaching us, there's a lot of laws, I didn't touch all of them, but the parasha is teaching us that yes, there is a judgment and righteous, we have to Tzedek, Yerdov Tzedek, we have to always chase the, 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 the whatever is just and right. But if there is an abuse because of some negligence or because of some kind of a violation that you think that, oh, but he owes me and therefore you could do whatever you want. I'm telling you, God says, something is going to be different. I'm going to listen to the cry. And whatever this person owes is being erased. And now I'm going to take care of that person. So God's ways of managing this world, if we are to emulate God, yes, because in Shlait says, try to emulate God in all the paths that are in, around us in our lives. And if you will pay attention to what God wants from us, because God is speaking to us through the Sefer Torah, and the Torah today is universal. Every human being has a Bible. Yes, the Bible is all the world in the world. So all of us can open it, and all of us can see it, and all of us can study it in every possible level you can imagine, and understand that God is speaking to us and telling us, I'm the one who wields the wheels of justice. So just choose to emulate me and we're going to be in a good place. Otherwise, I don't have to say what God says because it's written black and white. So let's hope so that... Parashat Mishpatim yeah. really lays the foundation of what a society should be. It, it, at first glance, it looks like a lot of different laws that you're like, what's the connection? What, what, what? It's here and it's there. And it, but then you see, after now I'm saying it's like, you know what? It lays the foundation of here's how a society should function. Absolutely. And then from there, the rest of the Torah says, okay, here's the particulars of how you do that society. Right. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.